as you work. And they'll begin to educate you on what's on that list, the types of drugs, the classes of medication that can have these kinds of side effects. And it's very important because in the elderly, they're very much different than you middle-aged people. And in the same way that children are not little adults, the elders are not mature adults. The physiology changes as you age in every organ system in the body. Excretion of metabolites alters. Metabolic clearance rates of medications change. Multiple medications not only have drug-drug interactions, but they may compete for the same degre you know, degradation mechanisms in the liver or the kidney. So that drugs that are supposed to be broken down by the cytochrome P450 system, somebody might be on other medications that's competing for that site. So the simple antidepressant you gave that just should have been terrific, now you have toxic levels. Now you have terrible side effects. Why is that? Because it can't get out of the body. And it should have. So this, this polypharmacy story, multiple medications, you need to be aware. If you give somebody something and they change, and you get an outcome that you didn't expect, go to the medication. It's not a new disease. Go look at those medications carefully. Sleep disturbances and delirium. Sleep disturbances are very common in the elderly. We heard some of that yesterday as well. And it impacts on depression and cognition. So these things begin to have intertwining relationships. Delirium can be very difficult to diagnose because you might see the hypokinetic variety, not the hyperkinetic. So hypokinetic delirium, that's a tough one, a real tough one. We had one. I'm leaving it at that. Metabolic disturbances. If your calcium is 15, believe me, it's hard to think straight. If your sodium is 110, it's hard to think straight. If your potassium is 1, really hard to think straight. Now, if you do a lot of uh, Jack Daniels, if you do a lot of Michelob Light, it's really hard to think straight. Now, the trouble with alcohol, as you know, and many of these people, no one's going to come up to you and say, hey, man, I drink a case of Michelob a day. You know, my brother-in-law does, but that's it. That's the only guy I know. Everybody else has never touched a drop. They're total teetotalers. Uh, until you put them in the hospital and they go into DTs. And you say, what was it? What? what? So alcohol is really surreptitious. Now, some people are proud of it and some people aren't. <laughs> Depends who you're dealing with, but don't you be forgetful. Don't you let it get you. Of course, structural brain disease, and the only way to diagnose that, of course, uh, at least definitively, is by uh, either MRI, CT scan. Sometimes you're lucky enough on a physical exam, you'll find focal findings. Um, this is a hard slide. The point of it is that the differential diagnosis of memory loss is going to include you know, dementia, cerebrovascular disease, delirium, and depression. So when you're looking at MCI, you want to keep all this in mind. Because it's not really a simple problem of, oh, Joe's a little forgetful. He never listens to me. It's not that simple. Now, this is the crux of the, the talk. If you've got a pencil, write this down. This is important. You want to look at reversible causes of cognitive impairment. So when the patient comes to you and you hear the story that we presented to you at the top of the hour, you want to look for evidence of depression, delirium. You want to measure and look for hypothyroidism. You want to measure a TSH and you want to get a free T4, T7, whatever floats your boat, but you want a TSH. You want to look for changes in the skin and the hair, et cetera. Drug side effects. Look at every medication. Call your pharmacist. Or go to the internet. Or go to UpToDate. Go to something that you trust. Look up the side effects, especially in the central nervous system. Critical. 
Um, look at metabolic disorders. So a chem profile makes great sense. A CBC, look for anemia. Now, within that, of course, if there are things that are suggestive, so if you come back with a CBC that has um, macrocytosis, let's say, increased MCV, MCH, start thinking about alcohol, vitamin B12, folic acid deficiency, you know, the B vitamins, start, you know, order those levels. That makes sense. So based upon the feedback you're getting from your testing, that's important. Alcohol use, other drugs, certainly you have to ask about it. Don't be surprised if somebody says, well, not really. And the question then is, how many drinks do you have at night? Well, I only have two every night. Not a big deal. Depends. So um, you're probably not often going to see neurosyphilis probably not going to see heavy metal toxicity unless your, your, your grandmother is into arsenic and old lace, that kind of thing. But these that are common, look for the common things. That's important. Um, this is a list of the, the original Beers list drugs. I know it's hard to see, but it's broken down into never use, occasional use, use if you can justify it. Sometimes you have to use drugs that have some danger. So again, you can get that from your, your pharmacist, you can get that off the internet, etc. Now this has uh, drugs that have anticholinergic side effects. Anticholinergic side effects can affect cognition, can affect uh, mood, attitude, etc. It can affect sleep. Anticholinergic drugs, uh, we use them all the time. If you look in, in the one point category, you'll see mirtazapine. Well, that was Remron. That's an antidepressant. That's a drug because of its side effects of, of uh, sedation and appetite stimulation. We kind of use in the right setting. But everything cuts with a double edged sword. You know, you don't get something for nothing. So whatever benefit you might get on the left hand, you might lose something on the right hand. Don't ever forget that. Ain't got nothing for, you don't get something for nothing. Okay? So the principles of evaluation of MCI. You need to focus on establishing the severity of the impairment, providing a baseline for follow-up, Exclude treatable conditions. The tools for the workup are the clinical interview with the patient and an informant. It's best to have a significant other, a spouse, a neighbor, somebody who can verify or corroborate whatever it is you're hearing from the patient. A cognition screen, as we've talked about, MMSE or whatever floats your boat, whatever you like to do, slums, mocha, whatever. A physical examination with a reasonable neurological exam. You're looking for focal findings. So if somebody has paresis on one side or the other, probably they had a stroke, etc. So you're looking for focality, something that's not symmetrical. Exclude psychiatric illness. Now that sounds straightforward, and I am here to tell you it ain't so easy. Very difficult. It's, you know, things that can look one way can be something else. Um, there's a fair amount of bipolar disease in this country, and it's aging. A lot of it's undiagnosed. There's a fair amount of depression, as I said before, in the, age, in the elderly population. There's any number of other uh, psychiatric illnesses for which um, you may not have a history. The patient may not have sought help. We had a patient who came in to uh, one of the local nursing homes who uh, was uh, totally misbehaved, was absolutely hard to control. Turns out she had a personality disorder. And she looked like she was bipolar, almost like a borderline personality defect. Instead, she had a different personality deficit, but it took quite a while to figure it out and to get help. 
So that's important, it's just not easy. The, neuro the neurological testing, either the MMSE, the MOCA, other tests, can be helpful as a screen. And once you've established a diagnosis, you can follow it along over time with the same screen. I think neurological or, or neuropsychological testing is incredibly important. All patients with MCI, in fact, should have formal neuropsych testing. It identifies the severity level, it identifies the elements of the brain that have been affected, the domains that are affected, and it gives you the ability to follow people over time. And if you institute medications, it gives you the ability to see if those medications are effective. Now, there aren't that many uh, medications that are currently effective, so. But in the future, we hope that's not going to be true, that there will be more choices. So its value is an objective measure of memory impairment, and it may aid in the detection of contributing or causative depression. That's very important. Neurological testing and clinical judgment are needed to make the diagnosis. There are no uniformly accepted criteria for MCI diagnosis by neuropsych testing alone. The uh, Folstein is uh, both sensitive and specific. There are other tests that can be used. Um, lastly, um, clinical judgment looks pretty good too. Also in your packet that you can get off the internet is a geriatric depression scale. This is a 15 question and it works well for me. Other people can screen with other questions. But I, I screen all my people with MCI, with this. Because I think it's incredibly important to get a clue if there's depression present. In terms of the role of neuroimaging, it is uncertain in the diagnosis of MCI, but most people would advocate at least a non-contrast CT to rule out cerebrovascular disease, subdural hematoma, normal pressure hydrocephalus, or a mass lesion. MRI with coronal slices can be helpful to evaluate hippocampal size and volume and predict who with MCI will go on to develop Alzheimer's. A PET scan, if you have access to it, may show temporal lobe and hippocampal metabolic sl uh, slowing and decreased glucose uptake. Um, the clinical dementia rating scale is what it looks like when you, you get it off the internet. Treatment. There's no current proof that uh, anticholinesterase inhibitor drugs like Aricept prevent progression from MCI to dementia. So that ain't gonna happen. People with MCI and comorbid depression have a high association with progression to AD. Thus a trial of Aricept may be helpful in this specific subgroup. Now, I should mention to you that all the ACEI drugs, although they may have some modicum of improvement in uh, psychological func uh, functioning in dementia, they also can cause all the same symptoms. So I, I caution you to read the side effects very carefully, because they cut both ways. NSAIDs show no evidence that these drugs affect MCI progression. Statins have no proven effect and may cause cognitive impairment, actually. Hypervitaminosis of antioxidants have no effect. People love to take some of everything. If a little bit is good, a lot's better. Nobody knows. There's no substantial proof of their benefit, but a good diet, physical exercise, continued mental stimulation are to be promoted. Obvious conditions like hypertension, diabetes, overweight, lack of exercise are to be addressed for overall good health and the possible avoidance of making vascular disease, both macro and micro, worse. So do good things, don't do bad things, and maybe it has a role to play, maybe not, but at this point, there's very little that's proven. The drugs that are available, there are three uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, uh, Aricept, Exelon, Razadine, or uh, Galantamine, Rivastigmine, and Donepazil. Uh, uh, Nemantidine or Nemenda is 